I mean, that was just awful. Let's talk about it. That and some injury updates as well. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Tuesday, May 21st, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team Every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. The Detroit Tigers lose eight to three on Monday night in game one of this Royal series. They fall to 23 and 24 on the season. So they are back under. 500 and the Royals who lost well over a hundred games a season ago are now 30 and 19 a big slap in the face to a, honestly a lot of franchises I feel like whose uh you know front offices and ownerships and whatnot have preached patience not that the Royals have been you know really good lately either uh but what a turnaround and I uh, you know what we'll, we got a lot of baseball left to play, as I as I continue to say in these first couple of months of the season. We got well over a hundred ball games left. We'll see what sticks and one what doesn't. I have a hard time believing they're like a ninety five plus win ball club, uh, but they have certainly gotten off to a really solid start this season, and uh, a lot of that is aside from just you know great talents like Bobby Witt Jr. and, and Pasquantino being healthy again. Uh, but a lot of their free agent acquisitions are playing pretty darn well. Uh, so they now find themselves at 30 and 19. Is there a team that is more frustrating to lose to out there for you personally? I want to hear from Tigers fans. I want to get a good gauge uh, of the opinion of this fan base. Is there a team that is more frustrating to lose to than the Royals? Now, I know a lot of people hate Cleveland. Uh, all the answers are probably going to be interdivision. I would imagine maybe some Yankees in there or whatnot. Or uh, I don't know if you if you watch the 80s teams, maybe the Blue Jays are still in there for you. But I feel like the Kansas City Royals are just in my lifetime, at least. Right? I was born in the in the 90s. I, I feel like the Royals are just consistently a thorn in this team's side, and uh, they get absolutely pumped on Monday night. Uh, This was a disaster of a baseball game. This this was an absolute bleep show, man. Um, What went wrong? Uh, (laughs) Sometimes it's even just funny to say that out loud. You know, sometimes you're, you're recapping a game and it goes so poorly. And like they lost by five, right? They didn't lose by 15, but like, Sometimes you recap a game and you go, what went wrong? Well, a lot. I I hope you're sitting down. Um, (laughs) Hope you have a lot of time uh, ahead of you. Probably, you know, about 24 minutes this time around. Uh, The entire offense outside of Kerry Carpenter and Colt Keith. Those two showed up, had pretty good days at the office. We'll talk about, you know, a little bit more in depth of what made their performances so noteworthy when we get to what went right in this game, but uh, this team had two total hits outside of those two gentlemen. Michael Walker had seven innings of two run ball with only three strikeouts. And like, that's the most frustrating part of this team is, you know, when they go up against somebody who's got a four and a half ERA, like Walker did going into this outing or, uh, really, I mean, go down the list, right? We talked last week about the Marlins. All those dudes had six and seven ERAs and shut you out. They're not going out there and, and you know, striking out 12 times, right? Like the 2022 offense is the worst Tigers offense I've ever seen in my life. And I was around for 03 and 2019, and that's still true. But it, it was 
it's just consistently weak grounders rolling over routine weak flyouts, etc. And that's what this game was. That was the epitome of this baseball game. I mean, we can go down the list and, and talk about, you know, some, some specifics, obviously, but just as a whole, just no ability to string hits together. Zero. Zero. There's no, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about Javi in a second, but like just double plays after double plays or like, oh, we're going to have two completely uncompetitive at bats and then we're going to get a hit with two outs and it's going to be a single and you know, there's zero chance that run is scoring like just consistently. Ride the green had two walks tonight, but in the month of May, which is not like we're three weeks into May now. Right, exactly. It's the twenty-first. He's hitting two thirty-four with a six sixty-five OPS in the month of May. Mark Canna, who you know, I, I still have no issues with bringing him in. I, I you know, I, I'm a fan of the move. I think he should be playing every day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I like what he brings to the team. All that jazz. In the month of May, he is hitting one seventy with a four ninety-three OPS remarkable his OPS on the season is now down to 762 now water was bound to find it find its level a little bit he had like an 880 OPS in April that was never going to last Mark Cannon has never been that and will never be that ever again um so I think you know if he can just get to what we said at the beginning of the season mid to high 700s OPS and walk in a lot I'll take it the frustrating thing is that profile is like the second or third best hitter on your entire team and as we said when we acquired Mark Hanna, he should not be anywhere close to the best player on your team. Best hitter in your lineup. That's been alarmingly close to true so far. But neither of the team's you know, two best hitters in, in April have been very good in the month of May. Spencer Torkelson. Spencer Torkelson. According to the Bally Sports Detroit broadcast, uh, is now two for 21 in his career with the bases loaded. In that at bat, right? And they weren't going to win the game. Okay. They, we can, it, it would have been cool. They would have lost by a run. Like, great. But you play to win the game. And obviously, you, we'll take a grand slam whenever we can get it. Would have made it a ball game again. But even just anything, really. <laughs> There were two outs. A single scores two. Two for 21 in his career with the bases loaded is just remarkable. And in that at-bat specifically, he was blown away by 91 mile an hour, a 91 mile an hour fastball that caught the heart of the plate. It wasn't a meatball down the middle, but it wasn't a shadow pitch either, right? That wasn't on the black. Man, just blow. Was that the first pitch of the at bat? Second pitch of the at bat? Just blown away. Late as all heck. Works the count full. And then it's late again on a 92, 93 mile an hour, two seam fastball sinker, whatever you want to call it these days, on the outside half of the plate. That also wasn't exactly on the black. Just looks really, really rough, man. Um, the only time he has been on time for fastballs this year, in the last couple of weeks, he's been doing damage on them, but the only time he's on time for them is when it's like predetermined before the pitch is even thrown. Like, all right, this is a fastball count. Just sit fastball over the heart of the plate and see what happens. Blown away by 91 miles an hour with the bases loaded blown away got plenty more that went wrong in this ball game we'll get into all of that right after this got to talk to y'all today about our friends over at linkedin sales navigator look 
Are you struggling to close your deals? Business to business selling is tougher than ever. And that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high value customers, drive higher revenue and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with people that actually matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That's linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to LinkedIn linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked On Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in as always, even after rough games like this. Appreciate you all for making us your first listen every single day. And shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll obviously be back tomorrow recapping game two and talking about any other news and notes from the organization. Also, be sure to check out Locked On Sports Today, the free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day bringing you the biggest stories in sports from all of our great hosts here at Locked On. So be sure to subscribe today on YouTube, Locked On Sports Today, or check it out for free in the Amazon Fire TV channels app. Talking about what went wrong in this ball game, and it is an absolute laundry list, as my mother used to say. Um, defense in this game. We talked about the offense. It wasn't good outside of two players. We'll get into them when we talk about what went right in this game, uh, the defense in this game was dreadful. And that is so quickly just becoming a reoccurring theme. I, I, I can't fathom that there is a team that has, and there are like worse defensive teams for sure, but I, I wish that there was two different stats for errors. I wish there were errors. And which is already like, you know, uh, scorekeeping and, and scorekeepers around the league have been getting pretty interesting, we'll say, with their error call error calls the last couple of years and especially this season. But I wish there were errors, and then they were there were oh my goodness, my eyes are bleeding. That was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Errors, because I feel like the Tigers are not going to lead the league in overall errors, I don't think, at least. I hope not. But they might lead the league in, oh my goodness, my eyes are bleeding. That was absolutely egregious errors. They might. What's the acronym for that? O-M-G. Anyway. The, uh, and we'll start with Riley Green because that's a little bit of an easier one. That's a tough play, admittedly, but the ball bounced off the heel of your glove. Let me, maybe let's bring that one in, you know. Um, really just glad that he's healthy, given the track record of him running into walls and making tough plays out in the outfield. Uh, looked like he was like grabbing his arm after I almost had a heart attack. Uh, but Jake Rogers had an absolutely dreadful day behind the dish. And, and I don't think he would tell you any differently. Um, not trying to speak for him, obviously, but but it was it was a rough one. And on top of having the rough day behind the plate. He did have a knock in this ball game. Even with the hit, he's batting 191 with a 542 OPS. He threw the ball to nobody at third base, and Gio Urshela made the right play. There was no one at home because Rodgers had to go out there, and Reese Olsen was not a part of the play. He was immobile. He said he blacked out after the game, was clearly not a part of of that play after getting hit with that comebacker. So no one's covering home. If Gio Urshela does not break for home, then the runner on third can just walk to the plate, right? So I, I fully respect and agree with Gio Urshela's decision to make a break for home. I have no clue 
what Jake Rogers was thinking there. I, I think he was just throwing before looking, just was assuming that someone was going to be there. Maybe he thought the base runner was was, uh, was Gio Urshela. I have zero clue, but it was brutal, and it cost them a run, obviously. Then he gets a pass ball on a ball thrown from the outfield that squeaks through, runners advance. Then he gets a traditional pass ball, two, one, at least one, on Alex Lang. Knee down, trying to get a frame. That's, you know, how baseball is, is, that's how catchers play these days. But with a runner on base, you, you better get that glove down. And he didn't. Really, really, really rough day behind the plate for a guy that I consistently go to bat for, no pun intended, with his defense. This one was inexcusable. It was rough. And he is not providing much of anything at all on the offensive side of things, to be able to afford, really, I guess I'll say, rough days defensively like this. And uh, really, I mean, this was just so awful. Like, you, you really can't afford anybody on your team to have as rough of a day as he did defensively. Uh, I mean, that that was was not great. It was absolutely brutal. Joey Wentz in this ball game. We have talked about his fastball at length over the past year. And it was brutal in this game. Uh, the velo was down. The command was bad. Uh, I didn't like the sequencing very much at all. I looked at my roommate. This is real. <laughs> when this game was going on, and I, when the count got to a full count, and I sp explicitly said, he's going to throw a fastball, and it's going to go 900 feet. And the next fastball he threw went 900 feet. I, I, I adamantly disagree with Joey Wentz being in a position where he should ever really be in a high leverage count and go, you know what, fastball here. Don't care how much better he's looked this year, which he has. That's important. Like you needed innings. You need innings in general, but especially when your starting pitcher goes, can't even go three because he gets hit by an 100 mile an hour comebacker, right? Brisky and Will Vest gave you multiple innings. In this one, you need your long reliever that has objectively had a great season so far. And that's not just ERA, that's peripherals included. He has been good. And he laid an absolute egg. Didn't record an out. The stuff looked like it did last year. Not what we have seen so far this season whatsoever. And, and I, I don't know how you don't at least throw the cutter there. And I know he, Salvador Perez was fouling off everything before that. I get it. I don't care. I'm not throwing Salvador Perez a fastball in a full count. A Joey Wentz fastball in a full count. You could not have paid me money to call a fastball in that situation if I was behind the plate. Probably would have had a lot more pass balls in this game. It's been a while. The knees are rusty. But I wouldn't have called a fastball there. Brutal stuff. Um, and then obviously the biggest thing that went wrong in this game, Reese Olsen getting hit by a comebacker over 100 miles an hour off the bat. We'll talk about that a little bit in stuff, kind of an injury update. Um, what else? I think the last thing I want to talk about is just Javi Baez looked abysmal at the plate. Again, uh, horrible at bats. Uh, two double plays in his first two ABs, both after Colt Keith hits. He goes 0 for 4. Even after his great weekend, he went like eight for 11 in the first two games and then had an RBI single on Sunday as well. Even after all of that this weekend, he's hitting 203 with a 510 OPS. He's an offer in the next two games away from having his average and OPS be under 200 and 500 still, respectively. Not great, Bob. Not great. Let's talk about what went right, because believe it or not, there is still some things that went right, and even more believe it or not, the, the run to make you down one late in this game was at the plate at one point, um, despite the, the crooked final score. So we will talk about all of that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at Prize Picks. Spring training is a thing of the past, and baseball season is officially 
underway. So don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond into your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs, take your pick of more or less and add them to your prize picks entry today. You can also get in on all the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks. As you and the world's best players take the game to a whole new level during basketball's postseason, a very fun NBA season and a very fun baseball season. One of my favorite things to do with prize picks, aside from, again, just getting in on all the great basketball that's being played, is uh, is just looking at starting pitcher strikeouts every single day. A, keeps me up to date on who's pitching that day around the league, but also it's just a really, really fun way to get in on all of the action that it has to offer on the baseball side of things. Really easy, really easy to root for as well. Uh, So download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all so much for tuning in, even after a rough ball game. Let's talk about what went right in this game, because there is a few things uh, still. There's always, no, I shouldn't say always, (laughs) because I'm going to say that, and they're going to lose 30 to nothing tomorrow. Um, There is usually (laughs) some, it's the beautiful thing about baseball. Uh, There's still something positive to take away. Bo Brisky, I thought, was awesome in this one. Two and a third of perfect baseball. No Ks and only one swing and miss. Um, But it was on a slider, which I think is fun just because that's the pitch that we've been talking so much about him needing to improve. He has a good fastball, good changeup. Got a lot of called strikes with the fastball, so I wasn't really worried about its lack of effectiveness per se. Um, I thought it looked really solid. It also sets up his great changeup. He has such a good changeup. I wish more people knew about it. I'd scream it from the rooftops. Like this dude has had a nasty change since he was in double A, right? He, He came onto this show when he was in double A few years back now and uh, we talked about it you know he, his changeup is a legitimate pitch and I think his fastball plays so much better out of the bullpen that it really sets up that change up and he can keep hitters off balance if he gets a decent slider it's over I, I genuinely believe that for the opponent that is um and uh and yeah so I, I thought that he looked really sharp despite maybe the lack of swing and miss in this one but a zero ERA so far since getting called up to the majors. Kerry Carpenter was incredible at the plate in this ball game. He was about five feet away from hitting a grand slam as well. He's now hitting 285 with an 893 OPS on the season. He was slumping for a little bit there, right? Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about how he had cooled off kind of at the beginning of May. It looks like he's back on track, which is absolutely fantastic. If I had to nitpick, A, just like be better against lefties, um, and I know that he hasn't got very many opportunities and people want to see him more against lefties, I get it. I would love to see him get more ABs against lefties, but he hasn't done anything in the lefty ABs he's been given this year. He has a batting average of like 070 with a 290 OPS. It's like 15 plate appearances, but um, he hasn't done anything with those opportunities that he has been given consistency would lead to better ones. I, I know what everyone's going to say. I get it. Uh, again, I, I want to see him get more opportunities than he's gotten as well. But in high leverage, I'm I'm kind of okay with the pinch hitting still. Um, but let's start him against a lefty, maybe. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the one thing I do want to nitpick is I would like to see him walk more. We've talked about that earlier in the season as well, uh, briefly. But, you know, like he's a guy where when he gets into a high leverage count, he's swinging. Right. Kerry Carpenter is not going to take too many high leverage pitches. And I think that that could be an Achilles heel. Uh, You know, the further down the road and the further into the season we get, uh, you know, in full counts, he seems to always be in swing mode. Now, that's something that I I think, you know, if he can not even be like a great walk drawer. Right. But if he can even be a seven percent walk rate. You're talking about a guy who uh, who could be a, a really, really solid hitter in this league for, for quite a long time. So uh, I, I would like to see that out of him. Cold Keith, hopefully it is happening. Okay, hopefully. I'm not saying it is, but hopefully it is. He's hitting the ball very hard lately. Uh, had an 108 and 109 mile an hour exit velo singles in this game had a three hit performance and had a four hit performance over the weekend. So um, has been heating up a little bit. 
Uh, this does also follow the trend of his minor league career, which I've mentioned a lot in, in kind of like preaching patience with him specifically so far in this first, you know, month and a half, two months of the season. Um, and that kind of does keep me optimistic about his future is the fact that he is following a relatively similar path. Just it's it's lasting longer um, than uh, than what he did in the minors. But if the timing is is down now, right, in, in, meaning he he like has the timing relatively figured out. Then it's about bat path and attack angle, right? Like w- once he starts lifting the ball, now that the timing again is better, that that's when the fun is really going to start with him. Uh, but but he's been hitting the ball really a lot harder lately. It's just on the ground, but he but he's pulling it more. I love that. That's a good sign of timing being a lot better, especially on fastballs. So I'm not like declaring everything. I'm not like oh look, it's the start. Like he's gonna you know take off now because I want to see him lift the baseball more, but, um, and obviously he struggled a lot. There's no denying that. Um, but we'll see. I, I, I liked what I saw in this game a lot. I think he's just a few adjustments away from kind of really taking that big step forward. So we'll keep an eye on that. Let's talk stuff. All right. Our, everyone's favorite segment here, our final segment of the show. Uh, Kenta Maeda can be eligible to return from the IL on Thursday. I guess it looks like he will. I don't know. Everyone's kind of being weird about it. They're like, oh yeah, he can, but like, we're not really sure. I don't know. We'll see what the Tigers have to say was like a quote on, on Monday. Like, okay, I I'm sure. Um, so we'll, we'll see, I guess. I guess we will see. We'll keep an eye on it. We'll see what happens. But he's eligible to return on Thursday. Reese Olsen, after the game, said he felt fine. Uh, a couple of the beat writers said that he was moving around a lot better, I think was the quote from McCoskey after the game, um, and says he should be fine, I think was the other quote. And I think it was McCoskey of the Detroit News that mentioned uh, that there's a potential for him not to miss any time. Now, if that's coming from Reese, I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. He's a competitor. He he didn't want to come out of the game, it looked like. Uh, he, he's a competitive dude. Obviously, he wants to stay in the game. I, I, I am going to take it a lot more uh, than than that if, you know, a, a coach says that or, you know, if the if the medical team says that, then Reese Olsen. Because, again, I, I think most people – after they get hit by that, kind of want to play. So we'll see what happens, but it is good news that he was moving around better and seems to be relatively fine, says he's going to bruise, but shouldn't be too big of a deal. That's good. I was really scared for a minute there. I, I thought that might it might have been something with the hip that was somewhat serious. Very good to hear, at least, you know, after the game here on Monday night, that uh, that it doesn't seem like it's going to be as bad. I, I think I am still expecting him to miss some time, but again, hopefully... It's just a short stint, maybe one trip on the IL. That's two times to the rotation. No biggie, no sweat, and uh, and he comes back. But um, also just in general, kind of the rotation of Maeda and Manning could be, you know, that could be somewhat concerning, I think. We'll see how it develops with Reese, but that, that, your rotation could take a pretty big hit pretty quickly. If uh, if you have Maeda and Manning, you know, going twice in a series, that and is not something that brings a smile to my face. I don't know what he did to deserve this luck, Reese Olson. Just a really, really bad beat this year. Getting no run support, getting hit by balls off the bat, just brutal. Um, okay, that's all. I, that's all. I don't want to talk about this ball game anymore. That was dreadful. Uh, the Tigers play again tonight. As you're listening to this on Tuesday at 7:40 p.m. Yet again, uh, that'll be Casey Mize versus Alec Marsh. Mize with a one-two record and a three-five ERA. Alec Marsh with a three-and-one rec- record and a two-four-three ERA. Uh, Marsh, I kind of mentioned it yesterday. His expected stats are much higher than his real stats, and his peripherals really aren't anything incredible. They aren't bad, but they aren't overly impressive either. Uh, Not a huge like swing and miss guy, not a huge strikeout guy, but I like his repertoire. He's got a good pitch mix. Uh, He has had a good pitch mix, um, and and he throws the ball in the strike zone. He's not going to walk too many hitters. So uh, we'll see. I think this is this is kind of. this is kind of an opportunity for the Tigers to wake their bats up. Ha ha. Like that's so fun. I say that, you know, like every other day and it never happens except when they're in Arizona. Uh, Casey Mize, same story, different day for him. Uh, Looking for some development and and some signs of life from that slider, looking for some effectiveness there. Um, Obviously keep an eye on the fastball as we always do. And then splitter command. Obviously it's his best pitch, but I feel like his command, his last couple outings of that pitch has been kind of shaky. It's been really good at times and, 
and not very good at times. So we will see. All right. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. And we will be back tomorrow recapping hopefully a win. Like, that's the thing, right? Like, you're behind the eight ball. That was an awful game. That was an awful game, right? If you win game two, you have Scooble game three. Like, having Tarek Scooble in your rotation is so awesome because genuinely – you just have to steal one of the first two if he's going in game three and you're putting yourself in a position to take a series. I will forgive and forget if you take the next two. If you don't, I'm not. <laughs> Pretty crazy how that works. Awful baseball game. Awful. Sloppy, gross, bad luck with injuries. Just absolutely brutal. Put it behind you. Go take game two and set yourself up for Scooble being on the mound in a series finale against the team that's ahead of you in your division. All right? Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all tomorrow, baby. Go Tigers.